great. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you to SCB and Journal of Experimental Botany for uh, enabling us to have these fantastic series of seminars. I'm Miriam Gifford, calling in from the University of Warwick in the UK, and delighted to uh, welcome our speaker today. Um, so we're going to be hearing about the research, but also getting to know the um, journey of discovery that led to this paper. So it's a pleasure to welcome Aladdin Safi, who um, started his career at the University in, in the University in Tunisia, was awarded a scholarship to carry out um, as master's and um, also doctoral study. And he did his PhD in the Department of Plant Systems Biology, working with Gabrielle Krupp and Benoit Lacombe in INRA in Montpellier. And you'll see today his work studying a really important um, interaction, trying to understand plant nitrogen sensing. And we know a bit about plant nitrogen sensing, but a lot less about what senses um, nitrogen deficit. And of course, this is crucial in agriculture. Um, so he put together a number of really exciting discoveries, discovering in fact a, a group of molecules that you'll hear all about. And the real strength of this work is in the biotechnological perspective that it opens up. So thinking about not just sensing, but a lack of sensing, enabling us to really understand uh, plant molecular development and nitrogen responses. Um, and also you'll see, of course, um, the lead role that was taken by Aladdin in this work, not only showing that, of course, he's a co-corresponding author for this paper that we're delighted to see in Journal of Experimental Botany, uh, but of course he's moved on to carry out his postdoc work in Ghent, working Tom Beekman's lab, um, moving off to auxin signaling and a little more on lateral root development. Um, so it's a great pleasure to learn about this paper and also the seminar series helps to showcase the real um, plant science leaders of the future. So delighted to um, present to you and I pass on to Ali. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you for this uh, long and detailed introduction. Um, I would like also to thank Elma and Enula for um, organizing this talk. Uh, I'm really delighted and uh, pleased to be here to present my work. Um, so today I will be uh, talking about um, how a group of GARP prescription factors control the nitrogen starvation response um, in different in two different pathways um, and how can they affect the high affinity nitrogen transport, which in turn will affect the plant growth. So first I will start with a general introduction uh, followed by a brief context of this study. Uh, and then I will present the results in two parts. Um, first, I will show the role of um, HHO transcription factors in the regulation of the nitrogen starvation response. And finally, uh, the role of ROS in this pathway. So as you know, nitrogen is very important macronutrient for all living organisms. Um, in plants, it represents up to 8% of the dry weight. And it's one of the essential macro, um, comp one of the essential composition of the of many macromolecules such as the nucleic acids, the proteins, the chlorophyll, and also phytohormones. And as you can see in this picture, the growth of end starved plants is severely affected compared to the plants grown in um, on end containing medium. And we know that nitrate is the main source of nitrogen used by plants. Uh, but the problem of nitrate is that he has very fluctuating availability in the soil. As you can see in this figure um, that represents the concentration of nitrate in the soil within 250 meters. So if we take, take these two points, for example, we see that nitrate concentration drops from seven millimolar to a uh, few micromolar. Together with its high 
solubility and leaching property, this makes nitrate very er, readily available in the soil. That's why farmers use fertilizers in order to guarantee a maximum input of nitrogen for plants and uh, especially for crops. The problem that the, the, the use of fertilizers comes with many drawbacks. Uh, first, the industrial nitrogen fixation is very energy demanding. And together with the emission of the nitrous oxide derived from the fertilizer, which is a major greenhouse gas. So this contributes to the problem of the climate change. On the other hand, the over application of um, of the uh, fertilizers combined with the leaching um, uh, uh, property can lead to eutrophication of water resources and can also lead to groundwater pollution by nature. So in order to limit these environmental and health problems, we need to better understand the way plants behave toward the nit nitrogen availability. In this simplified model, plants have two different main pathways. So as I said, it's simplified. Um, so the first one is known as primary nitrate response and happens when nitrate is supplied to nitrogen starved plants. So it's characterized by the rapid within minutes and high induction of primary nitrate response. Um, response marker, such as these genes, it's called um, HRS1, and other genes involved in nitrogen assimilation. And on the other hand, we have the nitrogen starvation response. So that takes place when plants are deprived from nitrogen. It, um, so at that moment, nitrogen starvation uh, response markers will be induced such as this nat um, natural transporter. It's high affinity natural trans transporters. Um, it's expressed uh, in the absence of nitrogen in order to retrieve traces of nitrate in the soil. The primary nitrogen, the primary nitrate response is much more studied and many molecular actors are known such as an RT11 transceptor, an AP, uh, transcription factors, the CPK kinase, the CPK kinase, and etc. However, on the other side, uh, for the nitrogen starvation response, only these genes have been linked to nitrogen starvation uh, response. So, this, for example, CBL7, LBD transcription factor, and uh, microRNA have been linked to NSA related phenotype but no mechanism have been described. So in this study, I will show, um, we showed already that HSO transcription factors are regulator of this pathway. Oh, so HSO transcription factors belong to the plant specific guard transcription factor family, which is composed of 56 members involved in several physiological pathways such as the organ developments, uh, clock oscillations, cytokinin uh, signaling, and phosphate signaling. Uh, and if you want to, to know more about this um, family, I invite you to visit our paper about it. But today I will be focusing about this uh, group called HHU for a HRS1 homologue. So this is composed uh, of the the first of HRS1, the first to be identified, and six other homologues. And if you look closer, you can see that the first four members share the same domains. And interestingly, they are all highly and rapidly induced by nitrate, sometimes within three minutes of nitrate applications. So the high responsiveness of HHO to nitrate prompt us to further study the, their role by ad identifying their target genes. To do so, we use the, called, um, um, the approach called target 
that allows to identify uh, the direct uh, target of uh, trans transcription factors. To do so, um, we use uh, root protoplast that we transfect with plasmid coding for um, HRS1 GR fusion. So this fusion will be sequestered in the cytoplasm until we treat with the dexamethasone that will re release it. Then the transcription factor will be uh, able to enter the nucleus and regulate its target genes. The addition of cyclohexamide will block the de novo protein synthesis, including um, uh, transcription factors, which will exclude the regulation of the indirect targets. Um, the six successfully transfected protoplast were will then sorted by uh, packs and RNA can be extracted and for further analysis. So we applied this approach for HRS1 and interestingly we found that NRT24, which is, I remind you, which um, high affinity natural transporter can, uh, tends to be repressed by HRS1. And also in another study, we found that two natural transporters, including NRT24, are upregulated in the double mutant HRS1, HH, HH1, and downregulated in two um, overexpression lines of HRS1 and its closed, closed homologue HHH1. So in order to um, Further study this regulation of NRT24 uh, by H, um, HRS1. We, um, we grow plant in N containing medium for two weeks and then we transfer them to minus N. So, as expected, nitrogen starvation and use the expression of NRT24 while it can barely be detected in plus N conditions. Interestingly, the overexpression of HRS1 and HH, HH1 in um, blue and, and red seems to be attenuated. Uh, their response to uh, the, rest, the expression of NRT24 in these two overexpression lines seems to be attenuated uh, in response to N starvation. And this is also true for two other uh, nitrogen starvation markers, such as NRT25, which is another natural, uh, high affinity natural transporter, and also GDH3, which is involved in um, N recycling. In another experiment, we also um, see in black the induction of uh, the upregulation of the nitrogen starvation marker in minus N. Uh, in gray, in plus N is not induced, uh, and the attenuated response in the uh, overexpressor HRS1. But, however, the double mutant phenotype was not exactly as we expected, um, since it only shows derepression at one, one time point. But if you think about it, this is normal because First, because of the redundancy with the other HH2 members, um, and also because of their low expression at minus N. So I remind you that HH2 are highly and rapidly induced up an N supply. However, their expression level at minus N is very low. So that's why we don't expect a strong phenotype uh, of the mutant uh, at minus N conditions. So we decided to change the experiment settings. So plants were first grown for 14 days um, on plus N, then transferred to minus N for three days, and then nitrate was applied for... Uh, sorry? And then nitrate was applied for uh, different time points. So we followed NRT2 for expression within this uh, time range uh, in the wild type, which is characterized by a slight um, and re relatively short induction followed by repression. 
We also uh, run in parallel the single, the double, the triple, and also uh, the quadruple mutants. And we found that HHO mutants, um, specifically the quadruple mutants, are enabled to completely repress NRT24. We also found that the derepression of um, nitrogen starvation uh, response uh, sentinel, sentinel genes follows the sequential deletion of HHO genes, as you can see clearly in these um, time points, with, uh, two hours after nitrogen, uh, nitrogen application. So this is also true for the two other nitrogen um, uh, NSR marker genes, NRT25 and GD3. So in order to validate this data, uh, we did a complement, complementation test using two independent lines. And we show that HRS1 and its homologs are functionally redundant. And, then, uh, and that uh, all HHO are repressor of NSR the sentinel genes. Then in order to study the functional uh, effect of NRT24 and NRT25 repression by HHO, we measured the nitrate uptake um, in n start plants uh, using um, 15 and uh, labeled, labeled 15 nitrogen. As you can see in the first graph, 35S HRS1 in blue um, has reduced nitrate uptake at low concentration uh, of nitrogen within the, the high, af high affinity transport range, especially, uh, especially at 100 micromolar. And this is consistent with an RT2 gene expression in the same samples. And as expected, the double mutant doesn't show a strong phenotype in minus N conditions. All the mutants, however, have higher nitrate uptake when going on plus N. We again see the increase of nitrate uptake following the sequential deletions of uh, HHO genes with higher effect in the growth of, um, of the plants. Uh, so here, as you can see, the quadruple mutants uh, have bigger rosettes compared to wild type. Uh, which is correlated with higher nitrate uptake, which is uh, more than two times uh, higher than the, in the wild type. So to summarize, we showed that N starvation and use the expression of nitrogen starvation markers, such as NRT24, NRT25, and GD3. And when we apply nitrate, HHO transcription factors will be very rapidly induced in order to repress this response. So the remaining question here is whether this regulation is direct or indirect. According to our target data, uh, this is a direct repression since the approach, um, this approach of target uh, allows the detection of a uh, direct target of uh, transcription factors. We also found that in the DAP-seq data, that NRT24 and other NSR marker gene also promoters are specifically in, um, enriched with HHO proteins, which is not the case, for example, for um, other guard transcription factor, which, which is called Kennedy, or, um, or another unrelated uh, basic transcription factors. So, to further investigate this data, we, we compared the promoter sequences of the top 500 downregulated genes in the target data using the MIM algorithm. And we found that this motif is highly uh, represented in, um, in this list. Uh, interestingly, this motif is quite similar to the, uh, these two motifs bound by HHO2 and HHO3 uh, identified by DAPSIC. <clears throat> so using JetShift, we proved that HRS1 bind um, 
an oligonucleotide uh, nucleotide sequence formed by uh, four times repetition of this motif. And with increased concentration of the non-labeled oligos, we show that the cold DNA sequence compete with the labeled one, and that this binding is specific. Uh, and to, to go further and uh, into the details of this binding, we decided to mutate the most conserved uh, residue, which are these two guanine and this cytosine. As you can see here, the use of up to 200 times excess of cold oligos mutated in either the two guanine or in the, th or in the three um, other residues. So the, the use of an excess mutated probe of this uh, motif does not compete with the white type version. Um, however, the, the oligo mutated only in the, this cytosine, so um, this version, uh, does it, it does compete with the oligo. So this means that unlike the, the cytosine, the two guanine are um, cru crucial for this binding. And because this motif is, is present in two different regions of NSR marker gene promoters, we decide to test a HRS1 binding to these regions. And indeed, we found that um, HRS1 was able to bind uh, two different promoter regions at, of at least NR224 and NR225. So in conclusion, our targets, um, QPCR and also MSA data, together with the DAPSEQ data, show that HHU um, directly regulate nitrogen starvation response by binding and repressing the expression of the marker genes. And this is strengthened by this work done by Kiba in Japan, using different uh, but complementary approaches, uh, such as a cheap qPCR and promoter trans uh, transactivation. Now, in the second part, um, I will be talking about the role of ROS in the uh, nitrogen starvation response. So first, we know that uh, nutrient and specifically nitrogen starvation induce ROS production in plant roots. So in order to understand more the role of ROS um, in this pathway, we decided to check the effect of uh, ROS removal by adding ROS scaven scavengers. So here we uh, co-treated plants with um, potassium iodide that scavenges um, H2O2 or mannitol that scavenges um, hydroxyl ion. And you can clearly see that ROS scavenging treatment completely kill the energy to induction by end starvation. This is also true for, um, for other uh, NSR marker. Sorry. Proving that the ROS scavengers are powerful NSR inhibitors. In another experiment, we applied either an individual or combined treatment of potassium iodide and mannitol but also DPE, which, uh, DPI, which is um, NADPH oxidase inhibitor. And all the treatments have negative effects on the upregulation of an, uh, NSR marker genes. In this graph on the left, we show that nitrogen starvation response is uh, highly affected in NADP, NADPH oxidase mutant and that um, H2O2 treatment in red can attenuate this phenotype in minus N conditions. On the left side, we show, um, you can see here that the quadruple mutant phenotype is also severely affected by ROS scavenging treatment. So taken together, all these data suggest that ROS are essential for the establishment of nitrogen starvation response. So to summarize, um, at minus N, 
ROS and uh, R and uh, produced and needed for the NSR establishment, then when we apply uh, nitrogen, HHU are rapidly induced uh, to directly repress this response. So, and in the last part, I will be um, talking about the interregulation of ROS and HHU consumption factors. Uh, back to the target data, HRS1 direct targets are, we can see that that um, HRS1 di uh, di direct targets are nitrogen dependent and contains many related um, ROS related genes such as MDR3, um, LH, uh, RBOH, mutant, catalase, uh, tyrodoxine and glutarodoxine, etc. And to validate this data, we performed qPCR to measure the to measure the expression of um, these genes, and we found that most of them are upregulated in the quadruple mutant, suggesting that um, HRS1 is involved in repressing the production of ROS. So, and that's why we measured the level of um, H2O2 in roots, and uh, as expected. The wild type has more H2O2 in the um, at minus n, while the overexpression lines have, um, are affected in this accumulation, which strengthens our hypothesis that HRS1 inhibits ROS production um, and or accumulation. And as discussed before, the muted phenotype at minus n is not so strong because of the low um, because of the low expression level of HHU uh, transcription factors at minus n. So we finally measured the activity of um, detoxifying enzyme uh, such as um, peroxidases, and we we found that they are depressed in the quadruple mutant, which is consistent with the. Um, with less accumulation of superoxide, as you can see here with um, NBT, staining, NBT staining. So in conclusion, uh, minus N, uh, at minus N conditions, uh, reactive oxygen species are produced and are needed for the uh, nitrogen starvation response establishment. Then uh, when nitrogen is applied, uh, HRS1, HRS1 transcription factor and its homologs are rapidly induced in order to repress this response. Uh, they will res uh, repress this response directly by binding to these pro to the promoter of these genes, but also um, indirectly by inhibiting the ROS production. So with this, I would like to thank um, uh, our group in, in BPMP in, uh, in Montpellier, uh, spe specifically Gabriel and Benoit, uh, I would like also to thank um, the finding um, uh, Agence Nationale de la Recherche um, AIL, and the project IMANA, uh, INRA CNRS, and also the Doctor Dr. School um, and Supergro. And I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you. I encourage anyone to put the uh, sound on so we can have a proper proper clap. <laughs> A few there, that's good. Yep, and some virtual claps coming up. That's always the bit I miss with the virtual seminars, a little bit. <laughs> Lovely. Well, thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed your seminar because you went through all the rationale of the work. And I know, of course, uh, when you're a research scientist, some rationale has to be fitted later, <laughs> depending on the results. But that came very nicely in the model, developing the model as you went through. And I think. I'm sure there were some moments there where you kind of scratch your head to, to try to understand the interactions. Um, but what I liked also is that the sim, there's a simplicity of the model too, which seems feasible because when you're devising models in molecular development, um, sometimes they're so complex that you can't imagine it actually happening in space and time in vivo, but this is very nice. So yeah, I actually, I remember uh, during my PhD, I was at the beginning, I, I made um, more complex uh, <laughs> model, uh, including an NLP and an RT11, 
And I remember that uh, Gabriel said, no, make it easy. <laughs> make it <simple." laughs> yeah, you have to make it simple for him to understand. That's true. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's very good. Um, just a reminder for everyone. So I know I've got a couple of questions to ask, but um, if you are able to ask a question, you can type it into the chat um, if you would like, and I can read it from there. Or you are very welcome also to uh, raise a virtual hand and I can call upon you, whichever you would prefer. Um, but as you have, everyone has a few moments to compose their questions, um, I also have a few questions of my own now having, having looked at all those aspects. Um, so this is, I, I think, as I said, what's interesting is the simplicity. And of course, you mention in the paper that it opens up the chance to um, use these for biotechnological applications. And I wondered, um, what's the best, what, what would you, what do you see as the key way forward there? Is it, is it breaking a link? Is it uh, making something more sensitive or less sensitive? And I wonder what the, perhaps the simplest way of doing that is. Yeah, uh, I think the simplest way to, uh, to, to use this, um, uh, like the, the phenotype of uh, nitrogen uptake and also the growth phenotype. Uh, I won't go for um, making like mutants, but maybe the easiest way is, if I can go back to, to the MSA data. I think the easiest way is with gene editing with the CRISPR, we can just mutate this to guanine and then we, we can avoid the repression of these uh, uh, high affinity nitro transporters. And then I think we can easily have more nitro, nitro, uh, nitro uptake and maybe better growth. Because yeah. if, we, if we go for uh, quadruple mutant, then we know that HHO transcription factors are also involved in other pathways like the phosphate signaling and then, yeah, then it can affect other um, signaling pathways. But by only killing two uh, guanine in the promoters of NRT2, I can. It's. I, I think it's the, the best. The best way to do it. Yeah, I think so. I think um, otherwise, particularly with nitrogen signaling, of course, everything's connected. And of course, you're you're moving on to look at auxin, which is even <laughs> it is even. Yeah, um, oxygen is everywhere. Perilous for that. Um, but I think you're right. I think with this um, precise engineering, your precise work to uncover those links, then you actually have the chance to, to make a change that's going to be relevant also that doesn't simply affect plant growth all the time, but affects the responsiveness. And I think that's, that's I think, kind of smarter yeah. plants, aren't yeah. they? Interesting. Um, while I wait for a couple of questions, please do not be scared. Um, <laughs> um, do, do pop your hand up eh, or even put your camera on as well is also fine and have a real hand coming up. Otherwise you can type things in. I go for my next question though. Um, so of course you, um, with your gene expression analysis, you have large numbers of clusters and you do a very nice job of, of trying to um, pull out of those, the essence of, of the changes. And, and then in your word cloud, G, I saw expansion pop up a lot. And I was just curious to see what that, what that family was or what the, whether, whether you could um, glean anything from that. I'm so not sure I... You had it well in one of your slides on the left hand side, you had a really large blue yellow heat map, and on the ah, top yes. right, you had a word cloud. And this is Not nice to look at the responses. Yeah, oh, there you go. So expansion comes. I mean, you were looking into pro domains there, I suppose, but you can see that that's a large one. And I wonder if that's if that's related to um, a physiological phenotype or or whether it's um, something else that you looked into? Oh, yeah, uh, that's a good question because um, first you can see that there is several clusters that are differentially regulated according to presence or absence of nitrate first, and also 
the dux treatment, which is, I mean, which means which means the, the entrance of HRS1 transcription factor to the nucleus or not. So, and according to these two parameters, you, we can divide it to uh, uh, several clusters. So these clusters are, uh, so for example, if we take this one, for example, it's uh, this cluster of genes are upregulated in presence of HRS1, but in absence, in the absence of nitrogen, of nitrate. And in the, in, in the opposite, they are downregulated in the presence of HRS1 and in the presence of nitrate. So they are differentially regulated in, in the two. Um, I don't know if I answered your questions or? Yeah, I know that's great. I'm just thinking, thinking a little about, I know that we, um, I'm often faced with these large collections of genes and trying to uh, trying to make something of them and, and connecting and understanding them. Um, I mean, you see really clear groupings and clear patterns here. Um, did you also, uh, so in your, in your paper, I ask another question, in your paper, of course, you look over time at the key changes you see. Um, how quick do you think um, the sensing and signaling goes on? If, so if we, if we have plants in an agricultural field that may be exposed to waves of deficit, but also waves of sufficiency, um, how quickly do you think the, the, this network can reset? Yeah. Uh, first, I mean, if we go to the, to the, go back to the two different uh, signaling pathways. So we know that the primary natural response is very fast uh, response, with, I mean, within minutes. Mm -hmm. However, the natural starvation response is very slow. It takes uh, days to, to, to take place. Uh, and also in, in the soil, um, the plant roots, maybe they are not, I mean, nitrate maybe is not um, homogeneously present in soil. So then we, we could talk about the long distance um, sig nitrogen signaling. Uh, but I mean, to, to stick more to my model, mm -hmm. I think the nitrogen starvation response is a long-term process while the, um, the repression by HRS1 uh, could be um, a fast one. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think I agree. Um, thank you for that. I pass, I'm going to read out a question from the, the chat. We have a still a few minutes left for any more coming through, but I will read this one out. This comes from Maria Smovaka. Uh, great talk. Um, I have a Ross related question. Do you have any hypothesis about the indirect regulation of HHO over the Ross production? that there's a few questions in here i'll read them all out does hho also transcriptionally regulate nadph because we know that upon abiotic stress ROS can also be produced by an nadph independent mechanism via the ion ascorbate machinery can hrs1 also regulate this pathway that's nice. three or four questions three or four quick questions in one i'll let you try and mull that over that's a very long question. So the last one I got, the last one, uh, she asked uh, if uh, HRS1 and HH, HHO can regulate NADPH oxidase genes. Uh, yeah, we with qPCR, we show that um, uh, NADPH oxidase gene are uh, regulated by HRS1. Uh, however, we don't know if this uh, regulation is direct. Uh, because we didn't do any uh, promoter activities or, or EMSA with uh, with this gene. And I know uh, yeah, certainly there's, there'll, there'll, there's certainly a number of pathways that will produce some of these small molecules. And the challenge then, of course, is understanding to what extent they're interact they're activating um, independent downstream pathways. Um, but the sort yeah, of yeah. pin pinpointing those interact pinpointing specific residues that make some of the specific links i suppose that's that's the 
the clearest way we could think about that. That is also the issue of the specificity of each uh, ROS species that can regulate that or that pathways or the combinations of um, different uh, entities of ROS. Okay, very good. Um, um, uh, we have a few, uh, few nice a few nice uh, messages in the chat to say um i think lots of support from your um old uh, lab mates and uh, uh how much they enjoyed your talk we shall make sure we save these messages because i think the questions that come up i always struggle to write them all down when i've left a seminar because they're always things to come up with but um they've got some good um happy comments from uh, previous work previous colleagues and um and team and uh, lots of people saying they've enjoyed your talk I think we have a couple of moments left. I was going to finish with a, a slightly non-scientific question because, of course, these seminar series, it's, it's nice to, I suppose, for people to meet the people who've done the work. Um, and you can see how you have put this all together. And I wonder, if, for the people who may be listening, who are at the stage of in the middle of a project, what, what are your sort of tips on how you manage to tie things up together into this story? Uh, that, <laughs> that's a difficult one because yeah, it it, it it depends. But I think it comes with uh, with the experience that I mean, with the experience you can at the beginning. Of course, you will need the help of your supervisors. By the way, I would thank again uh, Gabriel uh, for for his help. But also then with I mean with experience, then you can um, I mean. The, the more you read you, you read papers, the more you try to write something to write project, then you uh, it's easier to you to, to to imagine a story um, to write it down. So yeah, I don't really have specific tips for that, but I think it, it will come with, with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good because we take we take confidence in your in your ability to to to, to, to do that. And yes, absolutely. I think um, similarly here, probably presenting it again, you probably also see things, see, see things and new links to explore. And I think that's certainly absolutely the value. And I think that is the value of keeping seminars going here. And uh, even if we can't have the discussion face to face, it's a it's a good platform for that. Um, fantastic. Well, we shall, I think, wrap things up there. Um, and um, I've certainly enjoyed exploring, exploring the paper and um, and thinking a bit about the implications for the work we're doing in my group on nitrogen signaling. So I think we uh, thank Aladine again for a superb talk and thank you, many questions. <laughs> and, um, and also thanks to Society for Experimental Biology and Journal of Experimental Botany for um, helping to put all this together and all the, all the people behind the scenes for um, getting us on track and um, enabling this platform to happen. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.